The Lord be with you. All right. We about to have church. All right. That's right. You stay right there. We're going to, I'll give you some keys in a minute. You know, I have always joked that I am just waiting for the day when George really does, like, chime in, because then we might start, we might really start preaching then. Thank you, George. Now that you're all with us, um, now I can't even remember if I said the Lord be with you. There you go, we'll do it again. All right. John chapter 14 is where we're at this morning. John chapter 14, beginning with verse 1 and reading through verse 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. For now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, may we hear what you would have us to hear. Your words and not mine. May we hear as you call us to do what you would have us to do. That we may become the people. You call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You ever had a friend say to you, Hey, how you doing? And instead of the sort of normal, ah, right, I reckon, you tell them how it really is going. Or maybe you've had a friend do that to you. How's it going? Well, the things haven't been too good. Been working 60 hours a week for the past three months. Uh, Still behind, had a pipe burst at the house, ruined the shag carpet in the bathroom, leaked down into the living room, ruined my antique Naga hide furniture, it's all gone. By the way, what is a Naga and why did we put so much of its hide on furniture? That's Maybe that's a sermon for another day. Our little girl has chicken pox, father-in-law has been in the ICU for the past week, and I'm pretty sure when I cranked the car this morning it blew a head gasket. So yeah, things hadn't been really that great here lately. You tell your friend exactly how it's going. You, you, you sort of release all that pent-up frustration and exhaustion, hoping to find some catharsis in the simple act of just telling someone all this stuff that's been weighing you down. And what do they do? They say something to you like, well, worrying about it isn't going to help. Don't you hate that? You've got to be honest. You're at church. Doesn't that just drive you crazy? It's as if they dismissed your frustrations, your anxiety and fear. as nothing more than just idle chatter. If those things that concern you and and cause you to fret are are just childish problems that aren't worth losing sleep over. Now, I suppose if you're like me, you probably have some of those kinds of friends who are inclined to baptize everything in the thin veneer of their own theology. And so they might respond a little differently. Uh, When you tell them all these things, they might say, oh, what do they say? 
bless your heart. You got a lot on your plate, but don't worry, God's in control. Don't worry, God will never give you more than you can handle. Can we just go ahead right now and say, there's a moratorium on saying that. God will not give you more than you can handle. My goodness, you're going to have more than you can handle, and that's why you need God. But that's a sermon for another day. Now, we want to believe these sorts of things. We may even actually believe these sorts of things, but too often the stress of present reality is far more persuasive than the untried claims of our own spirituality. And so it's rough. It's rough when a friend responds that way, don't worry about it, almost casting your troubles aside as if they're meaningless, as if they're foolish, if, if you're foolish to worry about them in the first place. It's hard when you hear a friend say that. But what about when Jesus says it? I mean, that's, that's what he says, isn't it? Happens to be what he says at the very beginning of the text this morning, isn't it? Very first verse of chapter 14, Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. I feel like he says it that way, you know. Oh, just fly. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In the contemporary Chris translation, it says, Don't worry. Trust God, I got this. That's what he said. Now, I suppose that's all well and good as a, as a verse sort of plucked out of context. After all, when's the, the time we most often hear this passage? It's at a funeral. Gathered in a room like this, or, or maybe at a funeral home chapel, or uh, under a green tent around a hole in the ground. That's when we often hear these verses with a message about the needlessness. Don't worry about the one who's gone on before because they've gone on to a better place. Jesus says, I'll prepare a place for you. And while these verses may provide some sense of comfort in moments like those, that's not the original context of Jesus' words. When Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled, he is speaking to a group of disciples who have an awful lot over which their hearts ought to be troubled. You don't have to look very far back in the John's Gospel to see. Just a half chapter back, in chapter 13, Jesus tells his disciples, Guess what, fellas? I'm going to die. It's coming. Going to be arrested, betrayed, arrested, handed over, and be crucified. And one of you is the one who's going to betray me. And then, the way John tells it, it's as if they all know it's Judas. Judas, one of his 12 friends, one of their closest friends, one of the closest disciples to Jesus. We often picture Judas in the back corner in a black hood sort of wringing his hands, but no, he's one of the 12. A friend betrays them. And then Peter, the rock on which Jesus says he will build the church. In the very last verses before the text we read this morning, Peter says, oh, no, no, I will die for you, Jesus. Jesus says, nope. Before the rooster crows, you'll deny me. Not once, as if it were a mistake. Not twice, as if you slipped up forgetting the first. But three times. Because you'll mean it. That's enough to have the collective hearts of the disciples deeply troubled. For it surely seems like the whole thing is coming unglued, like this whole movement is about to crumble. And it's in that anxious atmosphere, all this going on, that Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And as if that weren't enough, as if all the things going on were not enough to trouble their hearts, Jesus tells them again, he's leaving. He's leaving. He's going to prepare a place for them. But he's going to leave. Oh yeah, sure, he's coming back. He says, if I go, I'm coming back to take you where I'm going. But he's got to leave. He's coming back to make sure everyone's together, abiding with one another, abiding with God. But he's leaving. He's got to go. But before his departure can even be added to the list of heart-troubling events for the disciples, Jesus almost sort of casually says, oh, and you know the way to the place where I am going. Do they? Do they know the way to the place? It's here 
It's here with the Apostle Thomas, and it's almost always Thomas. Thomas is sort of the fall guy in the fourth gospel. He says what we'd all really be thinking if we were there. You just sort of look around. Do you know the place? Do you know the place? Oh, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Thomas sort of has a, has a point, you know. Jesus doesn't actually tell them where he's going. He doesn't give them a physical address, not even so much as a zip code. It's as if Jesus just assumes the disciples knew no, as if he's told them before. But he hasn't, at least not in the way Thomas, and if we're honest, we would like to be told. You see, Thomas thought Jesus was talking about an actual place, a literal location, somewhere that they could find even in Jesus' absence if he would just tell them where it was. Thomas wants to know this final destination. Where does all of this wind up, Jesus? And don't we want to know that? Isn't that something we want to know? We want to know the end game, the ultimate resolution, the address to the finish line. Oh, oh we have the sort of comforting things. Say, oh, we know how it'll work out. But no, we want details. We spend all kinds of time and energy, spend our money on books and lectures and all kinds of things, trying to figure out where this whole wild ride of existence will wind us up in the end. We want to know. A final formula, an ultimate expression of purpose or salvation. Give me a definitive doctrinal list of do's and don'ts. We want a line. We want a line drawn in black and white and permanent ink. This is where it is. But why? Why does Thomas want to know? Why do we want to know? Sort of obvious, isn't it? Because there is a sense of security in knowing where things are headed. There's a sense of security in knowing where it'll all wind up, isn't there? After all, I'd be willing to bet that, that most of you would never get on a plane if you didn't know where it was going. But you, you'd get on it kindly if you could look on the boarding pass and see, ah, destination, wherever. Even if you trusted the pilot. Well, I bet most of us would be more likely to, to take on difficult tasks if we knew that the physical investment we gave would pay off in the end. If we knew with, without a shadow of a doubt that this is how it will wind up. That's really why Thomas speaks up and says to Jesus, Lord, we, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? It's as if he's saying, Lord, we're confused by all of this. We're not really sure where all of this is heading. I mean, after all, you're doing all these great things and, and people are, are being healed and fed and moved. And then over here, you're telling us you've got to leave and you're going to die. Just tell us where it's going to wind up. We don't even know. Now, I don't know about you, but I found myself praying the exact sentiment more than once in my life. Especially in those times when I don't know what's going on. But I don't know what the future holds. And it seems, and, and it seems as if the, the weight of all this life is too much to bear. I find myself going, Lord, just tell me what's at the end. Tell me where all this is going. There have been times when I've prayed to God just to show me where it's all going, to clue me in on what's ultimately going to happen to me, to us, to everything. If I knew. If I knew how it would all wind up, maybe I'd take a few more chances. But then again, they're not chances, are they, if we know where they wind up? Maybe I'd be a bit bolder. Maybe I wouldn't be so unsure of myself at times, so anxious about the future, concerned about the direction, the way things are headed. If I knew where it was all going, here's where some might say, well, now, well, now we know how it'll end. I've read the book, we say. Just turn to the end of Revelation. I know. Maybe. But you know, I've found the people who are so quick to say that are also the folks who are willing to get worked up over a few things outside of their own control if it happens to make them uncomfortable. Now I know, and I hope you know, God is God. And the grand narrative of Holy Scripture tells us that in the end, God wins. In the end, God is triumphant. But that still doesn't keep us from wanting to know, does it? It still doesn't keep us from wanting to know where it's all going, from wanting to know the way there. A few more details. 
Doesn't keep us from that, does it? It's in response to Thomas's confusion, our own confusion, that Jesus says, well, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you'll know my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Jesus' words here are not meant to be wielded as a weapon or some means of exclusivity in the centuries following his resurrection. But no, if you read the words in their context, they are words spoken to Thomas about finding the way. The way to the place Thomas thinks Jesus is going. Because you see, this place isn't a dot on a map or GPS coordinates. In fact, I'd be willing to say this place isn't well, may not be a place at all. No, if you listen to Jesus' word, it's a state of abiding with God. A way of living that brings one into the real, eternal presence of God. Jesus doesn't give Thomas a location, doesn't give him a formula to follow. Instead, Jesus says, as he always does, there's no address, no directions to get there. If you want to go, follow me. If you want to go, follow me. That's how you get there. It's as if Jesus is saying to us in those words that when the reality of this life is too much to bear, when we want to know the reason or purpose for all of this good, bad, and ugly stuff we deal with, to just follow Jesus. And we'll get to where we need to be. Or maybe, maybe more so that the whole point is that it's not about where we're going to be. Maybe the whole point is that where we need to be is following Jesus and not solely concerned about some imagined ultimate destination. I don't know. But I do know that God, God doesn't really seem to be the type to hand down a map from heaven with a giant X that marks the spot. After all, when God called Abram out of Haran, he said, go. Go to the land that I will show you. Doesn't tell him. I also know that when Moses led the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt, God didn't send Moses a list of directions with landmarks in the desert and outline steps. Instead, Exodus says, the Lord went in front of them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them along the way and a pillar of fire by night to give them light. God didn't lay it out in front of them. Just said, follow. And then, Every single time before Jesus ever showed the disciples he could walk on water, before he ever healed the sick, before he ever fed thousands, before he ever mentioned the cross or his resurrection, the first thing Jesus said to his disciples was what? Come and follow me. It doesn't seem to me that God is the type to give us a destination with an address. Rather, God seems to be the type who calls us along for the journey. To be able to abide in God's presence along the way, wherever that way may lead. But even so, even so, we're still people who who want something more. We want something more than just a call to follow. Come follow me, Jesus says. And the first thing we want to say is, okay, where are you going? We want to know. No, most times when life's waters begin to get rough, when we don't know where Jesus is taking us, we want signs, proof. And it's basically what Philip says to Jesus in the rest of this text Before us this morning, after Jesus says this thing to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Philip pipes up, "Uh, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Just, Just give us some proof of the existence of God, some evidence that God is behind all of this, and we'll leave you alone about it. Just, just, just give us something. We'll come along for the ride, but we're gonna need some proof. We may not know. You and I, we may not know where this ride will wind up taking us. We don't know how long we'll be on it. But if we could just have some signs along the way to let us know we're on the right track, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? But you know, there's a problem 
with such thinking. A problem with wanting signs to encourage or correct you, a sign to let you know you're on the right track or about to wander off the path. There's a real problem with wanting some sort of signal, some proof that everything is running on the rails or at the risk of going astray. Because you see, when you want a sign, when you want a sign to point you in a certain direction, you'll find one. You'll find a sign to point you in the way you want to go. Or should a sign actually come along and you don't like it, you'll find a way to sweep it under the rug. Oh, it's just heartburn, just indigestion, just a bad dream. This exchange between Jesus and Philip is a, is a real good example of what I'm talking about. Because you see, Philip says to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. But will they? Hasn't Jesus already done that? I mean, what exactly did they think Jesus would do? Pull his wallet out of his back pocket and go, here's a picture of me and Dad. What do they want? One of the biggest problems with wanting such a sign is right there. When we ask for proof, for signs, we already have some idea of what we want out of those signs. And if it doesn't go our way, we just dismiss it. It certainly wasn't from God. But what did Jesus, what did did Philip expect Jesus to show them? Can't you almost hear Jesus' disappointment in his response to Philip? Philip, I have been with you all this time, and you still do not know me? Philip's one of the first ones called in John's gospel, been there the longest. Jesus had to remind him that he's been with him all this time, a witness to these signs of power, turning water into wine, healing the sick, restoring sight to the blind, making the lame to walk. Not to mention, Philip would have been there at Bethany when Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb. Philip had witnessed all of these signs and heard Jesus' words, and still he wanted Jesus to show them something. I can't help but wonder how many times we find ourselves asking for a sign from God when we've already been through so much with God. How many times we ask for a sign from God and God's already been through so much with us. I suppose it's really no different from when those same Israelites that Moses took out of Egypt Wandered in the desert after seeing ten plagues, a pillar of cloud, a pillar of fire, of the Red Sea part, bread from heaven, and still they grumble and complain. Even if we come to accept that we won't know the final destination, and we still want signs along the way. Signposts to tell us, you're on the right track, keep up the good work. We still want signposts to tell us, we're going right. Yet all the while, God has shown us such signs. Sometimes, maybe most times, even when we're not looking. We want a final answer. And if we can't have that, we want to at least know we're on the right track. It may be the most difficult part of this life of faith. Trusting Jesus enough to follow him wherever he may lead when we can't see the road ahead, when we don't have a clear picture of the future, when we feel like we're not hearing anything from him. It may be the hardest thing to do to follow Jesus in silence and darkness. And yet, it's enough to trouble our hearts. Yet there's Jesus always calling us to follow There is Jesus always assuring us of God's love. There is Jesus even when we can't see the way ahead, even when the signs we pray for don't show up, even when we've had more than we can handle. There is Jesus always calling us to follow. When the weight of this world seems too great to bear, when the way forward is too clouded, with the fog of uncertainty, when you find yourself desperate for a sign, for proof, remember that maybe, just maybe, the point of all of this isn't where we wind up. But perhaps it's all about how we get there. Perhaps it's all about this grand journey of faith, following the one who calls us ever on the way, through truth and into everlasting life. you pray with me?
Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, when we get too caught up in the destination to not abide with you on this journey. Forgive us, Lord, when we seek our own signs and fail to see the ones you place before us. Forgive us, Lord, when we fail to follow in the fullness of faith. And Lord, be with us. Continue to call us, to call us ever on to follow you. And call us even now. And may we respond to that call with faithfulness. In your name we pray. Amen.